Good evening, everyone. I'm Ellen Myers, Programs and Communications Director from the Newton Free Library. I want to thank you for tuning in for this program on why lung cancer screening is important. We are honored to be welcoming Dr. Hugh Ogdenkloss, thoracic surgeon at um, Mass General Newton Wellesley and assistant professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Joining him will be Dr. Alicia Sequest, medical oncologist specializing in thoracic oncology. She is also director of the Center for Innovation in Early Cancer Detection and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Both of our esteemed speakers work at both Newton Wellesley and Mass General Hospitals um, and the Mass General location in Boston. Many thanks to the Morrill Memorial Library in Norwood, our Zoom partner and host, and also the Belmont Public Library who co-sponsored this session. Uh, I ask that you use the Q&A feature for any questions that arise. You may notice that the chat has been disabled, so we might chat out to you, but you will not be able to chat back to us. And also um, likely you'll see the closed captioning that's been enabled at the bottom of your screen. And this session is being recorded. Now it is my pleasure to turn the screen over to Dr. Akinfoss. Well, thank you so much. And we really appreciate the invitation to speak here today. Um, as Ellen said, I'm a thoracic surgeon, which means I specialize in lung cancer. My colleague, Dr. Sequist is a medical oncologist and she also specializes in lung cancer. And so we're very passionate about this issue. Um, we want to give a small presentation today to give you a sense of the state of, of lung cancer early detection, where we're at right now and where we hope to be in the future. So thanks very much for that opportunity. I'm going to share my screen now. Which I hope is now working. So um, I want to start with a real primer about lung cancer and cancer detection in general. So, sorry, my slide's not advancing. There we go. So my objectives uh, for this, this PowerPoint are just to define screening, the concept of cancer screening and the rationale for cancer screening programs in general. And then to try to apply that to lung cancer. Does screening make sense for lung cancer? And then to address the question of, does it work? And I think we'll show over the course of this uh, talk that yes, it very much does but it doesn't work for everyone yet. So let's begin with the first. Let's define screening and the rationale for uh, screening programs. So a screening test is designed to detect a cancer uh, in people that are asymptomatic. So they're at a preclinical stage of their disease. And the goal there is to intervene on that cancer at that early stage, and it's gonna improve the outcome. So the most common examples, the ones that are most familiar to people are mammography for breast cancer, and colonoscopy for colon cancer. Uh, pap smears are also an early detection method for cervical cancer. And those are probably the three most common uh, widely available screening tests. Now, in general, as, as medical practitioners, we think that prevention is uh, the best treatment for anything, but if you can't prevent something, screening is the next best. Um, and it ought to be better at least than the alternative, which is waiting for a disease to become symptomatic and, and treating it then. I think most people have a pretty easy time with the idea that screening for things is a good idea. And usually the question is actually the opposite. Why wouldn't you screen for every disease? Why wouldn't you screen for every type of cancer? And there's several uh, answers to that. Some of them are intuitive. So obviously it is quite expensive to screen everyone for every type of cancer. And there's some risk to patients. So there's uh, discomfort that's associated with tests. There's anxiety, there's unnecessary procedures. But there's also some more subtle things. For one, it's very hard to screen for rare cancers. And uh, I can illustrate that as a math problem rather than a science problem. Um, and then there's also a problem of overdiagnosis, which is that screening for everything may not actually be that helpful. Let's address this first one, uh, the math problem. It's hard to screen for rare cancers. And I ask you to just follow me in a hypothetical on this one. Let's imagine a, a hypothetical cancer, X, that's quite rare. It only happens in one in 10,000 people. And you develop a screening test that detects that cancer X, and it's a very good test. It picks up 100% of people that have the cancer, so it never gives you a false negative. Everyone who has the cancer that gets the test will, will have a positive test. But one in a thousand times, someone without the cancer will get a positive test. We call that a false positive. So this would be a 0.1% false positive rate. That's very good for a test. This is, this is quite a realistic example. 
But because there's some false positives in our hypothetical, if you have a positive test on this screen, you have to have a second more invasive test to confirm it. And that invasive test is accurate but it's a more invasive test and it has some complications. So walk with me here. Imagine it happens if you screen 10,000 people for this hypothetical cancer. Well, you're gonna pick up one person who really has it. Um, that's your true positive. You're also gonna get 10 people that test positive, but don't actually have the cancer. And you're not gonna know who's who. So you have to screen everyone again with the second more invasive test, or you have to screen all the positives. And what you end up with is a situation in which a positive test actually turns out to be 10 times more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. And you may subject one of these false positives to a more invasive test that ends up causing them a complication. So it's not a benign thing to screen a huge population of people for a rare disease. Now, what if you could limit your population a little bit to people that are more high risk for the cancer that you're looking for? So what if you found out that you had a risk factor that you could identify? Let's say you found cancer X in one in 500 people who smoke. Well, then you could limit your screening just to smokers and you'd have much better success because the test would be much more likely to be positive in that group because there are more cancers the rate of false negative of false positives would be the same. So overall, a positive test would be uh, much more likely to be true. Now you'd be limiting your screening population and you wouldn't do anything for the non-smokers, but at least your test would perform much more accurately and you would decrease the total cost to the system. What about this second issue? What about overdiagnosis? What does this mean? So not all cancers behave the same. Some cancers grow very slowly and patients go on and die from other causes. They die with their cancer rather than from their cancer. And this is a phenomenon that we've seen in many cancers that don't behave so aggressively. Um, but you can trick yourself very easily into believing that screening for these type of slow growing cancers has a positive effect on survival. Now, how could that happen? Well, this is a phenomenon that we call lead time bias. This is just one possible example. Imagine that at every green dot here is a time which somebody develops a type of cancer. And then the blue triangle is when that cancer presents with symptoms. So in between the green dot and the blue triangle, the patient has cancer but is unaware of it. And the red stop sign is when they go on to die from their cancer. Before an early detection test, the purple line, which illustrates the time from the blue triangle to the stop sign, is what we would consider to be the survival of that cancer. And here, let's just say the average purple line is five years. Now, what if we screen everyone for that cancer here at this point with an orange square? Now, you see that we know about the cancer earlier and the time to the stop sign is longer. So we say that the average purple line here looks to be about eight years. Now we've increased the average purple line, but we haven't moved the stop sign at all. So the actual amount of survival, the time that people, the time when people die from the cancer is exactly the same. Um, and it's very easy to get fooled for the, from this. And you would think this is kind of a hypothetical, but it turns out this is exactly what happened with diseases like prostate cancer, where we got very good at detecting them at early stages. And we didn't actually offer much in the way of treatment. And we never really changed the survival on the basis of detecting them early, such that we even stopped really looking for prostate cancer. And I've heard uh, oncologists and surgeons that specialize in thyroid cancer saying that if they never detected anyone with thyroid cancer again, that the actual mortality from thyroid cancer might go down. Because in recent years, we've gotten very good at detecting thyroid cancer and we do 15 times more operations for thyroid cancer than we did 25 years ago. And we haven't actually changed the survival from thyroid cancer at all. So this is a very real world phenomenon. So what is a better uh, situation to screen for cancer? Well, for one thing, you need a cancer that is prevalent. So that means that there is a lot of it in, a po in the population. That maximizes the public health benefit. Um, and it also, um, you want a, a cancer where you can identify risk factors that allow you to drill down on high risk groups. You also need a screening test that is both reliable, safe, and hopefully it's also cheap because it decreases the burden uh, on the healthcare system. But having a reliable and safe test minimizes that false positive, false negative result and the risk to the patients that undergo the test. 
And then the last one is, I think, the most important, which is you need really good evidence that intervening on a disease at an earlier stage, at that preclinical stage, makes a big difference in the survival from the disease. It's not worth screening for a disease just to know about. You, you really want to be able to do something and move that stop sign. Dr. Sequist and I are in the business of moving stop signs. So with those uh, sort of general objectives um, and general guidelines for screening in, uh, uh, stated, does it make sense to screen for lung cancer? Well, let's address them. Is lung cancer prevalent? Absolutely. So there are about a quarter million new cases of lung cancer in the United States in 2020. That makes it the second most common type of cancer uh, outpaced only by breast cancer. But there were 135,000 cancer deaths from lung cancer in 2020, which makes it the deadliest cancer in the United States. And that's true worldwide as well, where there are 1.6 million deaths uh, per year from lung cancer. And uh, importantly to that point, we can also identify high risk groups. And, and namely, what we can identify is that smoking is the number one risk factor for lung cancer. But there's a problem with that, which we'll get back to. Do we have a screening test for lung cancer? Yes, yeah, so um, the current lung cancer screening test that we employ is a annual low dose CT scan. We previously tried to screen patients for lung cancer with sputum samples, so coughed up sputum, uh, or just plain chest x-rays, and, and we weren't able to do anything with those. Those didn't, uh, they weren't sensitive enough. We weren't able to detect cancers at an early enough stage. Uh, but low dose uh, annual CT scans do. When I say low dose, it's one to four millisieverts of radiation because a lot of people do have uh, legitimate anxieties about the amount of radiation that you receive with a CT scan. It should be pointed out, this is a fifth of what you get from a normal CT scan. And it's the equivalent to about getting 15 x-rays or flying cross country about 50 times, or just the background radiation that you get from six months of, uh, of uh, normal background radiation. So it's a very low dose of radiation, which we think is safe for patients. We have very standardized results for lung cancer screening CT scans. We use this lung RADS system, which is highly reproducible across institutions. And so we've gotten very good at comparing results. Uh, so if you get your screening CT scan at Mass General versus Newton Wellesley Hospital versus another community hospital, the results are very standardized. And in the case of po uh, positive results, usually the only follow-up that's required is additional CT scans, occasionally a biopsy um, or surgery is needed. But let's drill down on this most important one. Is there evidence that intervening on cancer, uh, lung cancer specifically, uh, at an early preclinical stage is better? Are we gonna move the stop sign by screening for this disease? So let's talk about what we're saying when we're saying lung cancer. Everything underneath this umbrella of bronchogenic carcinoma is what we think of when we think of lung cancer. The three things are the four things on the side, mesothelioma, thymic tumors, chest wall tumors, metastases from other types of cancer to the lungs. These are all things that Dr. Sequist and I care much about um, as thoracic oncology experts, but they're not specifically what lung cancer screening is designed to detect. It's designed to detect mostly non-small cell lung cancer, the most common type of lung cancer, which represents about 85% of uh, lung cancers. Underneath the umbrella of non-small cell lung cancer, there's many different subtypes of which adenocarcinoma and squamous cell are the most common. For our intents and purposes, it really doesn't matter what subtype of non-small cell lung cancer you have. It matters much more what the stage is, how advanced the cancer is at the time of detection. Let's talk about lung cancer staging a bit. This is one hypothetical patient who presents to me with a uh, tumor just in the upper lobe of her left lung. This is her actual CT scan at the time of detection. We see an isolated tumor. There's no spread to any lymph nodes or anywhere else. We would call this a stage one lung cancer. And when treated with surgery or sometimes with radiation, it's a very curable disease. And 70% to 90% of people with this disease would be alive in five years with appropriate treatment. Another hypothetical patient, well, this is not hypothetical, this is an actual patient of mine, um, who has a much larger lung tumor, but more importantly, it's spread to lymph nodes that cluster around her windpipe. This is what her CT scan and her PET scan look like, showing uh, activity at the tumor in her left upper lobe, but also spread to more central lymph nodes that cluster around the windpipe 
This we would call stage 3A lung cancer. We've made huge progress in treating this disease recently with a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, newer modalities, but it is still a very difficult disease to treat and only 33% of patients with this disease would be alive in five years. And let's move on to the more extreme example. This is a patient who has a tumor in her right upper lobe. There's spread to multiple lymph nodes that cluster around her windpipe. And then more importantly, there's spread to the adrenal gland, um, which is in the abdomen. This we think is stage four or metastatic lung cancer. We treat it with chemotherapy or targeted therapy or immunotherapy, which is what Dr. Sequist specializes in. And again, we've made huge progress in the treatment of this disease, but still the survival of this disease is poor and less than 10% of people with this uh, presentation would be alive uh, five years after diagnosis. This is not a patient of mine. This is actually the CT scan of my grandmother who died from lung cancer uh, many years before lung cancer screening was widely available, which she would have qualified for. This just illustrates again, that lung cancer um, is very much a stage dependent survival. So the earlier it's detected, the earlier the stage is, the more likely a patient is to be alive in five years, including for stage one, uh, really early stage one lung cancer in which the survival can exceed 90% in five years, which is, is very good. But what's the problem? So catching lung cancer at an early stage is obviously crucial, but early stage lung cancer is usually asymptomatic or occasionally that's symptomatic, but the symptoms are very subtle and easily mistaken for basically any other lung process like pneumonia or exacerbation of uh, something like emphysema or COPD. Almost every symptom that we think of as being associated with lung cancer is associated with advanced lung cancer. So chest pain, shortness of breath, enlarged lymph nodes that are palpable to a patient, weight loss and fatigue, coughing up blood, these are almost always signs of advanced lung cancer. And as a result of this, almost 60 uh, to 70% of patients who have lung cancer come to the attention of a doctor when they already have advanced disease. Preclinical detection for this is key. So with that in mind, saying that what the rationale for screening programs are and uh, addressing that screening for lung cancer ought to make sense, does it actually work? The answer is an emphatic yes. So this is the best study that we have. This was published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was the result of a very large 10-year uh, lung cancer screening uh, trial in which high-risk patients, which they defined as smokers, were screened for a period of a couple of years with yearly low-dose CT scans. There was over 50,000 patients. And at the end of the study period, the relative reduction in the risk of death from lung cancer was 20% in the screening group. So 20% is a phenomenal outcome in a disease in which extending survival by two months can be earth shattering news. So this, was, this really changed the field of lung cancer management. It's since been replicated and more impressively so in other studies. So this is a recent study uh, from the Netherlands, the result of the Nelson trial. It was smaller. There was only uh, 13,000 men and 2,500 women in this trial, but the results were more impressive. So the men in the screening group had three quarters the rate of death from lung cancer compared to the non-screening group. Uh, and for women, the results were more impressive. Um, and what we learned from this study and many uh, follow-up studies is basically lung cancer screening works even better in non-white male populations. Um, and the results keep getting more impressive. And, and even better in this study, Almost all the cancers that were detected were early stage, so it made a huge difference in treatment, and there were much fewer false positives. In that 10-year period between the big trial and, and some of the follow-up ones, we got much better at interpreting CT scans and limiting the amount of invasive procedures that were needed to confirm positive results, such that in this pretty large study, there was no harm to anyone in the screening population um, as a result of, of being screened. So not only does lung cancer screening work, we think it works better than any other type of sc cancer screening modality that we have. Um, we, we sometimes illustrate this as a, the number needed to screen to prevent one death from cancer. Um, for colon cancer, it's 5,000 patients need to undergo a colonoscopy to save one person from dying from colon cancer. That is still very much a worthwhile number. 
Um, but uh, for breast cancer, it's better. Only 1,300 women need to undergo mammography to uh, prevent one death. And for lung cancer, it's only 300 patients that need to be screened. So this is the most impressive result that we have. So who's eligible? Who is that high risk population that we have currently expanded lung cancer screening to? And this is really where the problem comes in. We know that smokers are at the highest risk for lung cancer. And so as it stands currently, uh, lung cancer screening is limited to patients that have smoked more than 20 pack years. So one pack, if you smoke one pack a day for one year, that's one pack year. Uh, so it's limited to patients that smoke more than 20 pack years have quit smoking within the last 15 years, so they are recent smokers, and are between the ages of 50 and 80 years old. They also have to be in a partnership with their primary care physician who documents that they've discussed the risks and benefits of screening and shared the decision to undergo screening with the patient. So this is a pretty limited population. Even within that population, um, we haven't been very good about getting the word out. So only 5% of people that currently qualify for this incredibly effective screening modality actually get lung cancer screening. But more importantly, what about everyone else? So we are seeing more and more lung cancer in never smokers and light smokers and in younger people, uh, younger than 50. It's still an uncommon disease, but it's not rare anymore. The screening guidelines as they're currently written, they weren't intended to be exhaustive. They weren't intended to detect every person with lung cancer. They were intended to maximize the value of lung cancer screening as a test. Um, so we're missing this 10 to 20% of lung cancers that occur in non-smokers. And that number is growing, or at least that percentage is growing. So 30% of new non-small cell lung cancer cases are now occurring in non-smokers, and that's up from 15% in the 1970s. We're missing a huge population that we would like to be helping more, and we don't quite know how yet. But I do wanna end on a positive note, which is that the overall cancer mortality is decreasing. That's for all cancers. It's down 2.2% between 2016 and 2017. But the major driver of this is decreasing mortality from lung cancer. We have finally shifted the needle in a big way on this disease. Um, and it's dropping faster in recent years. A big portion of that is because of early detection. A big portion of that is also because of better treatment of end stage or late stage disease. But a big portion is early detection. So just to conclude my slides before we open it up um, for, for question and answer and for um, you know, to further address the issue of how can we help people that don't fit this narrow screening population, um, which is really what Dr. Sequest is an expert in. To conclude, lung cancer is common and deadly, and we understand at least one high-risk population. We have a test that's accurate, um, and it's readily available, um, and it makes a big difference because treating lung cancer at an early stage has vastly better outcomes than treating lung cancer at an advanced stage. Um, so we're getting better. Lung cancer screening works. Uh, lung cancer outcomes are improving, of which early detection is a big part, but we really need to do more for patients that don't qualify for screening right now. So we need to decide who else we can screen, how better to do it. And of course, we always need better prevention um, and better treatment for advanced stage disease. I want to thank you for your attention, and I really want to um, let Dr. Sequist um, add any additional comments before we add up to uh, open this up to, to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ockenclaus. And it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you tonight. Um, I wanna echo the last point, which was let's end on a hopeful note because um, I can honestly say that this is the most exciting time and the most hopeful time that there has ever been in the field of lung cancer as far as those of us who take care of patients. The number of treatments for lung cancer that are effective and can help um, help people live longer and help more people be cured has just been exploding over the last five to 10 years. Um, and so this is very hopeful for our patients, but we can really move the needle on preventing people from having to die from lung cancer if we improve the way that we're screening. Uh, Dr. Auchincloss did a fantastic job of outlining some of the problems that we have, which are, which are 
at, at first glance, they seem to be moving in different directions. You know, number one, we have this great screening test, but we're not deploying it. In this country, only about 15% of those who should be getting lung cancer screening are getting lung cancer screening. So it's very, very undersubscribed. At the same time, there's another huge group of people who are at risk for lung cancer and can't get access to screening, want to, are banging on the doors to get screened and they don't qualify by the current criteria. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do um, and it definitely gets us up in the morning every day and into work so that we can figure out how to come up with better solutions. You may have heard um, there's been a lot of press and a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm about some of these blood tests that are coming out. So I just wanted to mention that there as a family of tests, they're called multi-cancer early detection blood tests or MCED, M-C-E-D. Um, and the first company that's really been promoting their product is a company called Grail, but there are also several other companies that have tests that aren't quite ready um, to purchase, but the Grail test is available for pay out of pocket. It hasn't been accepted for uh, medical insurance coverage yet. But the idea behind all of these different MSED tests is that um, patients, people in the community over 50 years old who don't have any diagnosis of cancer, but could be at risk for a variety of different types of cancers, can go and get a blood test that would simultaneously screen them for multiple types of cancer. And this would include lung cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer, which we already have some screening tests for, even though they're not perfect, but it would also include screening for other cancers that we don't yet have uh, you know, any kind of standard screening tests, so things like pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, um, gastric cancer. So, um, it sounds really good. It sounds, you know, like a, uh, almost too good to be true. Um, and the, you know, my my personal opinion about these tests is that it is a little bit too early. We haven't really seen the definitive data yet that it can help us find cancers early. They certainly seem to be able to detect cancers, but a lot of the times the cancers that are picked up by these blood tests are no longer early stage. They've already spread and they may not be able to be um, cured. And so what we're really looking for is that test that will allow us to move the stop sign, as Dr. Auchincloss was saying. I do foresee that there's going to be an explosion of new ways to screen um, different types of populations for different types of cancer coming over the next decade. And so I think this is a really exciting area to keep your eye on. Um, and I'm so glad that you came tonight so we can talk more specifically about lung cancer screening. Um, I, I know that people have a lot of questions. So I think rather than just trying to continue lecturing, let's open it up for questions and um, we can answer the, what things are on your mind. Well, thanks so much to both of you. I mean, we, we really did um, hear such detailed information about the status of lung cancer treatment and early detection. Um, the questions are starting to come in. I'll start off and add a thought that I had to um, uh, the first uh, attendees. Uh, mine had to do with, um, is lung cancer more pre prevalent on a basis of gender or race? And adding to that, the question from one of our attendees, do you think that a child who grew up in the heavy smoking environment is at a higher risk of lung cancer? I can start off. I, I think um, there are many things that contribute to lung cancer and the most notorious is smoking, but that is certainly not the only thing that contributes. And um, you know, there are a large portion of patients who are heavy smokers for decades and never get lung cancer. And then on the flip side, we're seeing more and more people who have never smoked who do get lung cancer. And a, and a lot of people who smoked a long time ago were only short, for a short while. So there is something more to this disease than cigarette smoking. And we don't know exactly what it is. For any one person who gets diagnosed, it's very hard to point your finger and say, aha, this is what caused your lung cancer. We don't have a good way of testing that on our biopsies or our scans. 
Um, it's, it's becoming evident from the epidemiologic data that air pollution probably has something to do with lung cancer. And that's, again, not looking at any one person, but just looking at regions of the world um, and especially regions of the developing world where there is extreme amounts of air pollution, we're starting to see a big shift in the in the chance of getting lung cancer compared to before there was air pollution in, in certain countries. So um, you know, I think air pollution is a big player. There's been a lot of press over the years about radon, which you know I think when you really look at the evidence is maybe more of a minor player, but there's also, uh, a lot that we don't know about why one person would get lung cancer. Um, Hugh, do you want to add to that? I would only say that we, we at least know that some environmental factors are enough of an issue that we've been able to extend screening to one other population. Uh, Dr. Sequist, do you want to talk about your firefighter initiative? Oh, yeah. Um, well, this is a research study, so it's certainly not practice changing yet, but, but there are you know, there are factors that we think are um, put people at higher risk. Family history is one um, and occupational exposures can be another. So firefighters and other types of um, other types of occupations where there are a lot of fumes, a lot of chemicals, um, especially in the era before there was a lot of safety equipment. Uh, patients and people in certain jobs have have uh, had higher risks of cancers, including lung and other types. And so we've been running a research study um, since about 2020 in the uh, New England area, doing lung cancer screening for firefighters, the same exact screening test that a smoker would be able to access. Um, most of these firefighters don't qualify through the regular insurance mechanisms um, because many of them are, aren't um, heavy enough smokers or aren't smokers at all. And some of them are, are too young. You have to be 50 to, um, to access lung cancer screening through your insurance. And, you know, sometimes people start becoming a firefighter right out of high school. And so by the time they're 40, they may have 20 years of exposures. So we've been doing this research study to see if the uh, screening could potentially be a mechanism that's helpful for firefighters. And our study's not done yet, but you know, more research like this needs to be done among all types of uh, at-risk population. And another population that we think is at higher risk um, are people that served in, in the military overseas and were exposed to the burn pits, um, which is a common way of disposing of, of trash in, when you're uh, um, camping in a, in a military setting. That's a lot of environmental exposure. And it's also from, the, from a public policy standpoint, it's something that we have tried to drill down on because uh, initiatives that appeal to veterans tend to have a lot of political leverage. So we have really tried to, um, to, to use that particular risk factor as a way to extend screening at least to one other population still in process. One approach that we're taking in our research is in order to, instead of trying to understand every exact risk factor, is it a combination of gene X, Y, and Z and serving in the military and you know growing up next to a highway, instead of trying to dissect every risk factor, is there a test you can do on someone to say, what is your risk? You know, take all the exposures and genetics and everything that is in your past and Instead of trying to understand it, just look at the end equation. What is this person's risk? And we've been working with some computer scientists at MIT who use um, the computer to really look at a CAT scan in a totally different way than a human radiologist does. You know, a human radiologist says, okay, here's the, here's the right lung, here's the left lung, kind of really based on anatomy tries to look at, um, you know, what historically we've think is important, but our human brains don't always see patterns that computers see. And so we've been looking at the CAT scans kind of at the underlying, you know, zeros and ones all the way down to the basic data of the CAT scan and the whole three-dimensional volume of someone's chest to see if we can understand, is this person at high risk or low risk? And maybe then, you know, we can screen people who are at high risk and some of them may never have smoked and some of them may be younger than 50 years old, but they seem to be at high risk. It's another 
you know, early experimental approach we're taking at Mass General. You know, I'd like to jump in and, and sort of, again, combine a couple of questions. So um, there was some talk on social media that I mentioned to you based on a, a post that I put out for the library yesterday um, about the lack of availability of the test. And um, you just clearly explained, you know, who is eligible for the test. So um, first of all, um, one of the attendees would just like a little review of that, again, how the test is administered. And then also I'm wondering um, if your insurance company um, is uh, refusing you access to this test, is, is there a, a, um, a pathway to um, self-pay or other avenues that people can take to get tested? Can answer um, some of those questions. So how is the test administered? The current lung cancer screening test is a annual low dose CT scan. So um, uh, it's an imaging study. It requires that you sit in a CT scanner and get a, a CT scan that takes about 15 minutes. It doesn't require any uh, IV contrast, so no IVs need to be placed. Um, uh, the scan delivers, as I said, one to four millisieverts of radiation, which to translate into real world terms is about the same radiation that you get from six months of, of background radiation. Um, and it would be given once a year. Um, so it's, it's just a CT scan. Um, as to sort of the big question, you know, what do you do if you don't qualify now? Is there a way to get a lung cancer screening CT scan if you don't meet the current guidelines? And just to review the current guidelines, you have to have been a smoker um, with more than 20 pack year history. Um, so if you smoked for two packs a day for 10 years, that's 20 pack years, or one pack a day for 20 years, or half a pack a day for 40 years, that all adds up to 20 pack years. But you have to have quit less than 15 years ago, and you have to be between this age, narrow age group of 50 to 80. Um, and, and that all three of those we have issues with, I think. Um, and so right now, there is not a mechanism for getting a lung cancer screening CT scan if you don't meet that criteria. So your options are, you can meet a different type of criteria. So this is a screening CT scan of your chest, which means it's this low dose protocol, but you may need a diagnostic CT scan for something else. So if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, something that would require a physician to evaluate you with a CT scan, that's a diagnostic study that's different. It's not screening you for lung cancer, but it would practically have the same effect. Um, and so sometimes, don't tell the insurance companies this, we tell our patients that maybe when they say they're asymptomatic, they're actually symptomatic and they need a CT scan for another reason. Um, another thing you can do, and again, don't tell the insurance company this, is you can fudge the numbers a little bit. So if you quit smoking 20 years ago, are you sure it was 20 years ago? You didn't pick up a pack of cigarettes 10 years ago and have a puff, then it was 10 years ago. Um, and you qualify for lung cancer screening again. Or maybe you smoked a little bit more than you thought you did and your number is now 20 pack years. So I'm not endorsing this approach, but I kind of want you to get screened for lung cancer because I kind of don't think that quitting 15 years ago means that your risk of lung cancer drops back down to somebody who never smoked. I just don't believe that. I don't think Dr. Sequest does either. Um, I don't think that people over the age of 80 shouldn't necessarily be screened. I'll tell you that the rationale for 80 being the cutoff is we tend to think that every lung cancer became, you know, began as a tiny nodule and it took it many years to grow into a real cancer and then to spread and then to eventually cause harm to a patient. And we think that process probably pay, played out over five to 10 years. That's a reasonable estimate. And so somebody decided that the average 80 year old wasn't going to live more than 10 years. So it wasn't worth screening them for something that wouldn't kill them for 10 years. But that's not true because we all know lots of 80 year olds who are gonna live for another 25 years and have a hell of a time doing it. So there are clearly people who are older than this population that need to be screened. Now for our questioner who said that she had years of lung cancer screening and then sort of aged out of the screening program, 
it's very likely that there wasn't any findings on the CT scan and therefore they didn't feel like they needed to keep following anything. But this that's an example where one could clearly gain the system. And I don't want to say gain the system. That sounds bad when I'm actually endorsing it. Um, maybe there was a finding on one of those CT scans that needs to be followed up. And maybe a radiologist could take a very close look at the last CT scan and say, you know what, actually, I wish there was another follow up of that. So my thoughts. Can you talk a little bit more about risk factors in terms of um, exposures, for example, um, exposures um, um, of children to secondhand smoke or one of the questioners um, mentioned something about high temperature cooking oil. Um, someone um, had mentioned um, about being uh, woodworking as their hobby and um, that maybe sawdust can be a carcinogen. Um, so yeah, if you could just weigh in a little bit more on those things. Yeah, I, there are a lot of inhaled substances that have been linked to lung cancer, but we don't have great guidelines that an actual person could use, you know, like if other than with smoking, you know, we tend to have these guidelines of you can get screened if you've 20 pack years of smoking and it's very formulaic, but even that is just policies that have been made based on the way the initial studies were designed. We know that inhaling lots of little particles can be linked with cancer. So whether they're woodworking particles or, you know, silicosis particles from, uh, you know, certain jobs um, or, um, you know, other rare <laughs> types of jobs that there, there's lots of occupational exposures which can potentially cause lung cancer, but we just don't know exactly how to quantify that for any one person. You know, a good example actually is 9-11 um, is, is and the, the risk of people, not only the first responders, but just people who were in lower Manhattan that day and breathed in those toxic uh, dust, uh, you know, the rate of lung cancer is pretty high and other cancers as well. Um, but other, you know, short of a disastrous one day event like that, it's very hard to quantify um, who's at risk and, and um, it makes policies about screening hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one, one reason why I feel really strongly that if we develop tests that can tell us who's at risk, that can be more practical than trying to come up with formula, formulas about years of exposure. And uh, because we know that two people who had the exact same exposures can have different risks because of underlying genetic factors too. And we don't know exactly how to quantify those underlying genetic factors. I mean, I know that and I include myself in this because I do have a family member that died of lung cancer. Um, we are so grateful that you're in there fighting the good fight to try to get the insurance companies to change the criteria, which seem somewhat outdated given the changes in our environment and st health status of so many people. But is there anything that individuals that are not doctors can do to help move that needle? Um, so yeah, when we talk about getting them to change the guidelines. I think the most promising avenue, there's, there's two promising avenues. And one of my colleagues, Jeff Yang, has a nonprofit called the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, which has two aims. One is to get the FDA to help us broadcast available screening modalities. So that would focus on warnings on cigarette packs to replace the ones or supplement the ones that currently exist that advertise the existence of lung cancer screening. So hitting the population that already qualifies. But for the population that doesn't qualify, we'd like to amend the current guidelines through legislation. And we've, so far, we've been able to get it into committee where it's died and then it's come back in different committees. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress and we're trying to reintroduce it in this legislative session. But uh, through an act that was originally called Catherine's Early Detection Lung Cancer Screening Act to add into the language that anyone would qualify for um, lung cancer screening if their primary care physician believed that they should. That's very expansive language. 
that's not likely to make it through legislation in its current form, but that's kind of the thrust that we're going for because that solves all of these dilemmas. If your primary care physician could decide that you qualified on the basis of some other nebulous, difficult to quantify risk factor, um, then you would qualify and insurance companies wouldn't be able to say anything about it. And that's what we'd love the legislation to say and that's how we'd like the new guidelines to read. Um, there was a question in the chat about uh, what does the CT scanner look like? So I did, um, I just pulled a picture of one from the internet if I can share it. Great, thank you so much. So I think the, the am I showing a CT scan picture right yes. now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so this is a pretty typical CT scanner. Um, it's not an open setup. So sometimes people that are um, very claustrophobic um, have a difficult time with MRIs, which take many, many minutes, sometimes hours. Um, and so they have an open MRI machine, but a scan through this, which is a closed um, system, so you go through the tube, um, only takes a couple seconds. It's basically the length of one breath hold. And so even patients that have claustrophobia are usually able to have a CT scan like this. Thank you. All right, let me uh, stop. Then. I can also uh, say that one thing all of us can do to enable things like the legislation that he was talking about to get gain more traction and go through is to work to decrease the stigma around lung cancer and around smoking. Um, there's this is something that really plagues the lung cancer community and uh, you know efforts to try and improve access to lung cancer screening. It's because it came from a good place. You know, I think there were so many public awareness campaigns in the 1970s and 80s that smoking can be harmful to your health and can cause cancer. Um, and, and real visual commercials that really linked in people's minds smoking and cancer, that the unintended negative consequence was of that was that a lot of people subconsciously believe that people who get lung cancer deserve it because how could they not know that smoking causes cancer? When in fact, it's a very complicated issue. It's an addictive substance, nicotine is, and there have been um, you know, a lot of uh, campaigns by the tobacco companies to get people addicted at a young age, especially people in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And um, you know, we can go on a whole tangent about those, those types of tactics that were used, but it's not so simple as just knowing smoking is bad for you, you should have stopped. That stigma that people have about lung cancer really influences a lot of these policies. And I can show you an example, I can share the screen here real quick of, you know, Medicare policy um, tells, tells insurance companies and Medicare how to pay for things and what's covered. And this one slide is the complete CMS or the Medicaid, um, qualifications for breast cancer uh, screening. It's, it's very short, it's very simple. And um, essentially uh, at the end of the day, this third bullet point here is the physician's judgment that a mammogram is appropriate. Kind of like what Hugh was saying we should do for lung screening. And we don't have to go through every one of these, but there are uh, six slides on the qualifications of how to get lung cancer screening paid for. There's just a stigma that this has to be harder. And not only is the patient qual qualifications that we've already been over part of the reimbursement, um, but there are also specific mandates about how the orders have to be written, how the radiologist who interprets a scan has to be board certified and interpret at least 300 scans in the last three years. There's qualifications about the facility, about the system. Um, this type of onerous Bureaucracy does not exist for other types of cancer screening, only lung cancer screening. And I think that all of these layers that make it more difficult come ultimately from stigma. So that's my two cents about that. I, I mean, I think it's very interesting that, you know, there's six um, PowerPoint or uh, Google slide um, slides worth of information on how to qualify for lung cancer screening and one for breast cancer screening, which most women, uh, after a certain age get every year, um, the screenings, you know, one of the um, attendees wants to know how 
what would be the likelihood of a successful appeal? And again, I want to know how expensive the, this screening is because is it why is the insurance company are the insurance companies um, creating these vast barriers to access? Yeah, so it's it's actually not. I don't think it's fair to blame the insurance company here. They are following the guidelines that exist for them, and so appealing to them won't work in this setting. You, what, what you have a better chance of doing is qualifying for a diagnostic CT scan for another reason. Um, but until we change the guidelines, the insurance companies are standing on the best evidence that they have. And in previous times, insurance companies have actually been right about this. They have denied treatments that didn't have evidence to support them despite a huge amount of public uproar and ended up being proven right um, I'm thinking specifically about um, hormone replacement therapy for um, uh, breast cancer, but that doesn't mean they're right all the time, not by a long shot, but they, they do have a leg to stand on when it comes to following the guidelines. Um, so appealing to them is not going to work here until we, the experts in the field, change the guidelines and convince the, the, the powers that be to change the guidelines. That's what we would like to do. Um, I do want to, there was a couple questions in the chat that I think Dr. Sequest would be great at answering. So one was the, um, why are we seeing an increase in lung cancer among non-smokers? And also what are the genetic, what's the role of genetics in lung cancer? Yeah, I wish I had, I had solid answers for those questions. We don't know exactly why we're seeing an increase, but it's quite clear that around the world we are. And the leading hypothesis is that it has to do with air pollution. Um, and not any special kind of, you know, nuclear active air pollution, but just your standard carbon, you know, soot based air pollution. Um, and um, uh, the World Health Organization has actually uh, declared that, that uh, air pollution is the number one cause of lung cancer around the world. And there are political uh, groups around the world working to try to um, you know, improve that. I think climate change is also going to really affect uh, lung cancer rates because, um, you know, as the climate changes and more uh, the concentration of these different pollutants in the air is, is in some ways magnified by the changing temperature and, uh, and people are moving into more concentrated areas to get away from rising waters and increase heat around the equator. Uh, you know, we're going we're going to see more of this. So there's also a big, um, uh, you know, political movement about out there about climate change and lung cancer and how you know this is yet another reason why we need to work on climate change. Um, you know, the fires that we see uh, that that take over an entire, you know, acres and acres of land, that that can be a huge uh, influx of pollutants that can cause lung cancer. Um, the genetics, you know, we don't have a defined gene that is inherited in families the way that, you know, a very few cancers do, but there are a couple of Define genetic syndromes where, like BRCA1, where you might be at risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and there are some known inherited colon cancer genes. We don't, have, we haven't discovered that yet for lung cancer, uh, but we, we can clearly see patterns that there are families where multiple people in the family get lung cancer, and you know, so. Um, there, there probably is some genetic component, but we don't have a way to test for it. We don't have a way for you to go to a genetic counselor and find out if you have the lung cancer gene. Um, I think that can be sometimes confusing because a lot of the most exciting developments in the treatment of particularly advanced lung cancer is in um, targeted therapy, which target mutations that are specific to lung cancer like EGFR and ALK and MET, these are, are terms that are, are um, sort of made their way into the lay um, literature now, but these are not inheritable mutations. We don't think that a patient who has an, a lung cancer that's driven by an EGFR mutation um, is gonna pass that mutation onto their family. Good point. Well, we have a few minutes left and I'm just wondering, um, and I, I imagine folks would like to know 
what your experience as doctors are with the quality of life with people in treatment. I, I imagine there are vastly different um, ways of answering that question, but, and um, I'll just put that out there. Well, I think it's Dr. Seacrest and I sometimes see different sides of that elephant. Um, for me as a lung cancer specialist, uh, as a surgeon, I mostly see patients with early stage lung cancer for which surgery, upfront surgery, tends to be the best option and is very successful. And sometimes I have to remind myself that when I'm seeing a patient who has an early stage lung cancer, I think I'm giving them good news, um, but they're hearing lung cancer. Um, but lung cancer that I tend to treat primarily, um, we have very good outcomes with. Um, that's not always true with patients that have more advanced uh, cancer like the, the type that Dr. Seacrest would specialize in. Yeah, I, I think that um, there have been tremendous changes in lung cancer, even, even for stage four advanced lung cancer in the course of my career. Over the last 20 years, we've seen uh, it go from a invariable death sentence where people generally had less than a year to live and the only treatment was chemotherapy that made you lose your hair and there was lots of you know vomiting and horrible side effects to a completely different picture today because of advances in understanding the genetics of cancers. Many of our treatments are pills that people take at home every day while they go to work, while they continue to travel if there's no pandemic and you know all the, all the things that they like to do with their family. There's immune therapies now, which can basically harness your immune system and get it to attack the cancer. And people are living years longer than they used to, again, with pretty normal quality of life. Um, and so it's, it's really a difference. And there's been a big improvement over the past couple decades in, in supportive care as well. So there are much better nausea medicines. Those movies from the 80s where people carried a bucket around because they were on chemotherapy throwing up all the time, that just never happens uh, to that extent because of the newer nausea medicines that are available. Um, so there's been huge advances in cancer and lung cancer is probably at the leading edge of what has changed the most uh, you know, in recent years. And so there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope for what's coming down the pike next. And um, you know, I, I think, I hope that all of you have learned something tonight and will take home the message, remembering that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. It's not just a smoker's disease. It's, you know, no one's at fault for getting lung cancer. We have to all work on uh, uh, on opening the gates to screen everyone who's at risk. Um, that's our future mission. I think I just want to wrap up with one very brief question. Um, again, is it would it be helpful for um, individuals to uh, uh, you know make appeals to legislators in order to again to move that needle? I mean, I, th I think people really want to know that. Yeah, if you're looking for someone to target in particular, Frank Pallone is the, um, he's a congressman from New Jersey, and he is the chair of the um, Energy and Commerce Committee, which somehow oversees legislation related to healthcare. And that's the committee in which our legislation is most held up in. So let Frank Pallone know that this, this issue matters to you. And there are several organizations that are working on these types of problems as well. So, you know, the one that's in the chat, the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative is fantastic. Um, the American Lung Association focuses on this. Um, longevity, um, uh, the American Cancer Society, uh, so many. Um, so find a way to get involved and um, together we're gonna really change the future, I think. Thank you so much, Dr. Alkenklaus and Dr. Sequist. Again, thank you to the um, Morrow Memorial Library in Norwood and the Belmont Library for helping get the word out about this important program. What an educational evening you've provided for us. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question in the chat. I'm always happy to, to talk to anyone. If anyone wants to send me an email, I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you okay. so, so much, everyone. And I'll, I'll end the session now.